So good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out to HBLR's uh, Spring Conference on Benefit Corporations. It's really wonderful to see uh, a lot of interested students uh, and also uh, the, the great participants that we have lined up today here in the audience. Um, just a quick note before we get started, um, I wanted to check, is there anyone from the press here? If so, please raise your hand. OK, so I just wanted to say some, some of the uh, topics discussed in the panels are sensitive information. And if you hear something a particular panelist says and you know, you're, you're kind of interested in, in posting that online or something, please, during our kind of networking opportunities, uh, go ahead and, and stop and ask them and just talk about it. Because again, we want this to be a very open discussion. Um, and, and I think uh, our panelists are kind of relying on your uh, judgment and making sure you, you ask them before posting anything. Um, that being said, uh, the, the conference is being recorded. But um, for each particular panel, uh, we, we can arrange uh, if, if there's confidentiality for a certain panel. That's no problem at all. So thanks again for coming out. Um, it looks like there aren't any journalists in the room, so um, I'll carry on. Well, uh, we're excited to, about the program we have today. I think it's going to be a, uh, a great setup, a great day, and a lot of really interesting discussions. Uh, we're going to get started with uh, Chief Justice Leo Strine. He's the Chief Justice of the Delaware Supreme Court. Um, Chief Justice Strine uh, was previously Chancellor of the Delaware Court of Chancery, Vice Chancellor before that. He has served on uh, teaching positions at a number of law schools, including here at Harvard. And he also served as special counsel to the governor of Delaware. And he was a litigator at Skadden, also in Delaware. So we're really glad to have him here to, to get us started and start, um, start this discussion on benefit corporations, which again is a movement that, that we at HBLR and I hope all of you are excited about. So with no further ado, I'd like to welcome to the stage Chief Justice Leo Strine. It's really an, uh, an honor to be here. This is one of my uh, favorite places in the world, um, close to um, one of the most unique public facilities in America. And if you don't know what I mean, then I encourage David to, if you need to use the facilities. And this is true for women. We, I've taken women to this room. I admit I'm on tape and I'm, I believe in equal opportunity, which means the most interesting benefactor gift at the Harvard Law School should be available to women to see. I think it's important that the room be cleared out before women view it. Um, if some of you are looking at it and saying, this guy, that this is intriguing, <laughs> you're right. It doesn't take long. I'm not saying it will transform your life, but it might make, give a smile. And it's right here on the second floor of Wasserstein. As I was say, it's special to know. I, I, I learned today that David is, uh, is the son of uh, a very wonderful Delaware lawyer and, then, and the nephew of another. And I had not known that, and there are people um, for whom I have the highest respect, and so it's, it's nice to see a fellow Delawarean here. I, I'm, I'm glad you're all here, and, and actually it's nice, it's, um, it's interesting. This is a, I go to a lot of musical performances by 20-something musical artists, and it appears to be easier to get young people to a room to talk about benefit corporations than it is to actually listen to live music. Um, and uh, have any of you heard an entire album by an artist? Uh, Who's heard of Maya Hawthorne? Oh man, you guys are sad, sad, <laughs> sad, sad, sad. Um, but the upside is that you're focused on your studies and the future humanity. And what's kind of interesting about this, and I will say a generational thing, I've been privileged in um, the role that I've had on behalf of my state to be involved both in Delaware and at the national level in you know, issues of public policy around corporate governance. And Rick Alexander, who is a wonderful lawyer from our state and, you know, one of a, a, a truly thoughtful corporate lawyer, and he thinks deeply about these things. He and I are, are privileged to be on the Corporate Laws Committee of the, of the American Bar Association, which works on the Model Business Corporation Act. It's sort of the mini-me for people who, you know, are outside of Delaware. They sort of thought, no, I'm kidding. I, but they, uh, the Model Business Corporation Act, a version of it is in most states that's not, that are not Delaware. And it, this group is really truly comprised of 
you know, the finest corporate lawyers around the country. It's a very difficult group to be involved with. And Delaware and that group, there was a lot of skepticism. And, and frankly, some of the practitioners in the sort of middle age group, and I put Rick, who I think with me would, is one of the few people brave enough to admit that he's not a progressive. Why is he brave enough to say he's not a progressive? Because I, don't, I think he's actually willing to say that he's a liberal and doesn't have to hide behind the P word uh, for political correctness. There was some skepticism on the part of Delaware corporate lawyers and national corporate lawyers about whether this movement was real. And it was interesting, some of the most senior lawyers from around the country on the National Committee went to the people in their community and their children and their grandchildren in the Pacific Northwest, in the Colorado area, in this corridor up here. And when there were some you know, folks who had been sort of in the period of being inculcated with the law and, law and economics movement, the you know, law and ampersand, law and zoology, um, law and culinary arts. <laughs> These folks came back who were senior lawyers and said, if you speak to the young entrepreneurial community, they're all interested in this. And a lot of the things that they say about the difficulties of running a business in a smart way um, for society, but also for investors, the difficulties of doing it, in the, doing it sound a lot like managers of our traditional public companies say about today's markets. When people fixate on quarterly earnings, when that has no relevance to building sustainable wealth for people, when gimmicky things that go away, go away, and when people are saving for college and retirement, and when oftentimes doing things the, the, the right way and the bold way over time um, is the best way to maximize value for everyone, and we have capital markets and, and regulations and stuff that make it difficult. And so a lot of these hard-boiled kind of, you know, older corporate lawyers were the ones who verified that there was really an emerging interest among your generation. And that's true across the river, right? We're here in the, um, you know, the, the lesser palace. The greater palace is across the river at <laughs> HBA. Yeah, look, uh, the... The students here are doing a wonderful job with what they have. There's no pedicure. There would be pedicures <laughs> across the thing. But I think this, what I like about this, and you'll see the title of my paper, I'm not going to, one of the things I think those of us who've been involved in actually trying to make change in the world least respect is when folks stand back and watch other people and just tell them to be better. Just tell them to be more courageous than the average person, to just do the right thing. And they ignore the power dynamics within, which, within the institutions within which those people have to operate. And for far too long, the American Legal Academy and the business press have lectured boards of directors to just do the right thing. Why can't you give us immediate takeover premiums, which is our friend Lucian's dream, you know? Because remember, if everybody just had a few more sell side premium, the world would be a better place. <laughs> As if America, the one thing we haven't had is sell side premium, sell side premium. While we have a stagnant median wage, we've got sell side premium. You know, but asking people who are elected by equity to, and can be thrown out of office by equity and are often, to manage for the long run when the people who are voting and influencing the corporation don't think in the long run, to ask them to try to balance the interests of workers and the environment and society against, and none of those constituencies have votes, that's nice to tell them to do that particularly when they come out, and it's also interesting, it's, a, it's an, a, an odd idea to think that corporate directors as a social class are who you would want balancing all these social interests. And then there are scholars, many of whom are my friends, who say corporate law says directors can do anything they want. They don't have to put stockholders first within the limits of the law. And I suppose they just view it as some sort of coincidence, right? 
I mean, it's not really Darwinian because there's nothing Darwinian about, nothing coincidental about Darwinian evolution, right? Things survive for a reason. They develop for a reason. So this is just purely happenstance that the design of corporate law gives only stockholders the right to vote, only stockholders the right to sue, only stockholders the right to build on transactions. That's just totally incidental to the fundamental purpose, right? That's no insight into purpose. It's just some oddment that happened. And that the directors, despite being in a regime where those facts are true, right, are not supposed to, within the bounds of legal discretion, put the stockholders first. And they have the flexibility to make other interests equal. Well, some, some minds who I think might, may, might even admit, although they wear Birkenstocks and stuff, so they probably may be too afraid at times to say the L word, um, actually looked at things and said, you know, that's nice to talk about that, but what about the actual power relations within the law? What if we can, in an incremental way, shift them? We're not radical. That's why I call it a liberal innovation, which is liberals like conservatives, conservatives temper, true conservatives, I don't mean reactionary. I mean the true Burkean, the, the idea of preserving what's best, being careful about losing it when you make, being bold about moving forward. But the incremental, the person who believes in social progress but recognizes the, the um, fallibility of humanity. What you do is you try to work within institutions and see if there's a way to move them forward in a, in a beneficial way. And that's essentially what the benefit corporation model does, right? It's still fundamentally conservative because only stockholders have the vote. But it doesn't say that directors may do certain things. It says that they shall. It obligates to, them to do it. And it gives, it therefore requires directors to consider these interests. And it also empowers them because duty does matter. When someone has a duty to do something, they're, they're more likely to do it. People often call on duty at stressful times in relationships and remember that they made a, a vow to be true to that oath. But there's also power behind it because there are super majorities which protect the commitment to those ideals. And in real world M&A situations we'll talk about, those power dynamics can matter very much to how constituencies are treated. And this also fosters the development of power within the equity capital movement around the idea of sustainability. A lot of the key questions to be asked are whether people are actually going to vote their conscience, whether we can deal with some of the incentives. But what I think and what ultimately convinced the, the, the folks in Delaware was meeting real business people who had every awareness of the duty that they own to the people who entrust their equity capital to them, who put their money on the line. They recognize that those people deserve a return. And these entrepreneurs are committed to delivering that. And I think they're actually to say that they, I think some of them have a little bit of hubris. And I think they'd say, watch what I do for you over 10 or 20 years and you'll be happier with it under this model. But they also think that there's a right way to do business and there are wrong ways to do business. And what convinced a lot of people in Delaware was meeting real business people, and you're gonna see some of them today, about how serious they were and about the reasons why they believe that the shifts in power dynamics that the benefit statutes are doing were important. There's not a panacea here. This is not a radical thing. It's not co-determination. The workers don't have a vote on the boards. I mean, I might like them to, and I'm, I don't mind saying it on tape. I would say, by the way, is there any journalist in the room who lied when you were asked whether you were a journalist? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I am a person who believes that power dynamics matter. And I do believe that what's going on with the benefit corporations gives entrepreneurs and gives socially responsible investors the ability to sustain a vision over time in a way that it's more difficult to do in today's capital markets under the traditional model. There are many questions to be answered, but the movement in the power dynamics is real. And I would also say that within the borders of the United States, um, this is 
you know, there's this conversation going on, but this is really a global conversation. And I think Andrew and Jay mentioned that they're going to be, you know, over in Oxford or something like that, or they were in Oxford, they're going to be over there reliving all the crime, all those detective novels set in, in Oxford. Um, I believe they volunteered Andrew to actually be the body at the, uh, at the you know, the, that splat below some tower, uh, academic tower. Um, but you know, there, in Europe, sustainability is really coming to the forefront. There are real concerns about climate change and about how we go forward with the method of capitalism we have that works for everybody. Um, and so I think this is an exciting topic. I, I think the students should ask some hard questions. I have one, one of my big questions is why we don't see people from the labor community at these sorts of things. And I think one of the big challenges I'll throw out there, and that'll be the last word I say, is the challenge for the movement is to bring together the people who purport to work, represent the working people and the people who are the entrepreneurs who say that they're doing business in a way that actually values human capital. I think that's a huge opportunity that needs to be taken. And also the question of engagement around the socially responsible investment community and whether they're actually going to step up, vote their principles, because if they're voting, for example, it's one thing to do the investing, but if they're voting in the same way as everyone else, it's going to be very difficult for these corporations to succeed. But I think we're already seeing in Delaware vibrant interest in them. Um, and so I think the students, you've selected something that's about the future. And I think it's something that's going to be about your future, whether you practice in the United States or you practice globally. Uh, and it's a conversation we all need to have if we're going to be proud of the world that we um, leave to our own children and grandchildren. So I applaud the journal for all the hard work. And we've got some pretty cool people. I mean, look, we've got somebody who gets mentioned regularly on Morning Joe. And you know, that's like nerd cool at just a level that a Delaware judge can just never hope to aspire to. So, <laughs> thank you all. So we'd just like to welcome up uh, the, our, our investment panel. Um, I think we, we can get started in just, uh, just two minutes or so. Let's see, I think your mic's all on. Okay. All right, and this will be kind of an experiment in social responsibility because we have three mics for four people. So uh, I'll see how that.